back. You're listening to You Would Think, the Philadelphia Flyers podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Collington. And joining me once again, Kevin. Kevin, um, have you had a, a busy week or has it been like nice and calm or what's the what's the deal with you? N- nothing noteworthy happened at all, right? Just another week, you know, there was four games on. That was that was a little bit yeah. more than usual. We do have a lot to get into. The Flyers did play four <laughs> games. They may or may not have done some other stuff as well. As we're diving into that, follow us on social media at YWT Podcast. Follow Kevin at Kevin underscore Darso. Find us everywhere you find your podcasts. Okay. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, <laughs> so let's start off the top. Let's start with basically how the week started because the only my- story that mattered at the beginning of the week. I mean, right. the game, truthfully. The, ga- the week starts with a game Monday night against Pittsburgh at home in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Very quickly, that game becomes entirely irrelevant for the evening. Correct. Because about what well, was about five or six minutes into the first period. Yes. The Philadelphia Flyers tweeted and somebody else tweeted simultaneously. But we'll get to that. Uh, the Philadelphia Flyers tweeted that Cutter Gauthier has been traded to the Anaheim Ducks in exchange for Jamie Drysdale and a 2025 second round pick. Mm-hmm. Now, first of all, what? <laughs> this, the immediate yeah. reaction and we were talking about this a little bit before the show the immediate reaction kind of across the internet was wait a minute is this is this real and mm-hmm. then the next layer of it is that it came from the official flyers twitter account and then the next layer of it is that we start getting all of these other details immediately about you know who may well, or sure. may not have wanted to be here and who may or may not have done some things and we will get into all of that but it became very quickly apparent that it was real. Danny Breer spoke to the media after the first period. Mm-hmm. Uh, the largest Flyers trade in a very long time. In a very long time. Probably the closest thing. I mean, significance-wise, the closest thing that matches it in recent memory is the Claude Giroux trade. Because, yeah. and uh, Significance-wise, not return-wise or, or magnitude of the trade, but significance-wise. Just because it was trading your captain and a franchise player, like although, a guy who had been a staple. The, but the, the way Owen Tippett's playing, the returns looking not sure, too well, sure, bad. sure, sure. <laughs> I, oh, I get it, but you know what I mean. Like, it, it, you knew it was going to be an underwhelming return from that sense because there was I a know. lot of there were just fans that were going to sit there and say there was nothing that was worth it. Like, sure, it, sure, it, sure. The day, that day just kind of and and that was the complete opposite of this too because that was he he played his thousandth game, he sat out the next night. It was the writing was so on we the all wall. Know. Yeah. So we all just were waiting for it to drop, right? Like just tell us when it's finalized. It's not even a matter of if, it's just tell us when. We knew that trade was happening three weeks before it happened. Sure. We didn't know we, who, we didn't know where, but we knew he was gone. But we also could all we could well, we but we could circle certain things. Like we could circle that date on the calendar where it's like they're gonna try to get him to a thousand, and then after that, the deadline's three days later. This is all gonna happen right here. Well, speaking of dates circled on the calendar, Cutter <laughs> Gauthier's return to anaheim will certainly be circled because oh yeah this was not your typical hockey trade where where one team has assets and another team has assets and this team calls that team and says hey i want that asset and the other team goes okay great send this asset back yes obviously that is what happened but the biggest story that kind of emerged out of this um Mm -hmm. was to, to kind of put it a little bluntly, to paint with a, a wide brush here, mm-hmm. essentially it came out that Cutter Goche did not want to be a Philadelphia Flyer. Right. So so th- the only way to talk about this, and I and, and let me just start by saying to preface the whole thing here, I'm exhausted. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm exhausted in different ways, like in terms of like four games in a week is already a little bit tiring enough as it is because there's a lot of, you know. Right. Things, you know, with the preview, watching the game, recapping it, doing all these other things or whatever. What I'm also like getting in when I say I'm exhausted is, is that by this point, the thing happened Monday night. Yep. My entire Tuesday became, this is what we're going to talk about. I go on the station. Yep. I was on OMB podcast this week. That was pre, by the way, pre, like pre-scheduled. I was already going on to just talk about the halfway point of the season. And then all of a sudden the flyers go, nope, no, you're Never not. Mind. Here's you're a trade. About something else. This is all you're going to talk about for an hour. You know, like I, was, they, I think we did like a little more than an hour on that show, like an hour 20, and, something like that. And quite frankly, thinking. if we didn't have some time restrictions on the podcast today, we'd probably do another hour. On oh, we're here. just, we're just going to do, yeah, we're just going <laughs> to, and we're just talking about this strictly first. Like we honestly may not even get to some of the really good stuff from the week after right. the fact that also it obviously once the day of the trade happens the rest doesn't become secondary but 
this whole week, it's felt a little secondary because there were even elements of this that carried over to the following games to an extent right. that you're like, that actually became more of a talking point than the game itself for a little bit, like, or even, if, yeah, even just for a little. So I'm tired of talking about this because ultimately, like, there's so many layers to something like this, especially when there's reasons or sure, you're looking sure. for reasons, right? Because this just didn't happen. Oh, I mean, for goodness sake, you, I still know, like, you texted me not long after everything went down or in the midst of everything and even said, we just spent an hour or like not an hour, but like a long time on the previous episode last week, pumping this kid's tires. Yep. Cause yeah, no, world juniors was great. We just, did, it was within 24 hours. We recorded the episode within 24 hours. <laughs> we of sure did. Trade it. So Monday news drop. Talk, uh, the, the Monday news drop to end all Monday news drops, you know, kind of, <laughs> Truly. Um, but like, that's what we're saying. Like we just spent all that time on that. So, you know, this is obviously huge, like, Absolutely. And, and you're going to start looking for the reasons. So I'm getting like I by Thursday, I was past the point of I don't care about looking for reasons anymore. It's over with. Let's just focus because he's gone. Right. Well, That's because, the most important well, because also by that point, think about from my perspective. OK, I cover the part of the trade. The trade happens. I got to write, you know, actively write the literally actively write a trade summary during the first period of the game danny's going to talk after the first period there's all sorts of other stuff going on throughout the course of the day S you know sound quotable moments everywhere throughout the course of that night. oh yeah and then oh yeah and then the next day you're parsing the whole thing which means not only the long form article that i wrote but also the appearances to try to break this whole thing down what happened all that stuff and then the next night there's another game and oh by the way it's not just like oh it's not like it was Trades like this could have been. It could have been truthfully. Cutter Gautier for, and it, you can't even pick. But no, but you, right. But you can't even pick the guy that they picked first this past year because he's even played in the NHL already. Right. Like you can't even say it was for Leo Carlson, and that's you know I'm not saying that that would have been considered a fair trade. Like, right. well, and and you know, I, but you know what I mean. I do think it does make sense for us to kind of skip the cutter Gauthier slander at this point because it doesn't really matter. The kid decided he doesn't want to be here. He actually I have the stuff in my I have stuff in my notes of things I want to say that will kind of touch on it, but I'm not right. spending a ton of time on it. Totally. Um but but you get my point about the other side of this where it's like it's not like yeah. they just brought back a guy who were sitting there going, Okay, now we're well, watching right. his college games. Now we're watching his junior game. No, no, no. He played Wednesday. Well, and that's what I wanted to get into because we talked on last week's show, like we've talked on every show this week, about the fact that mm -hmm. this week was a tester week. You had a game against Pittsburgh and then two games against kind of teams towards the bottom half of the NHL. And then you finish the game or you finish the week with a big Saturday night game in Winnipeg. Right. If the Flyers hadn't done anything off the ice this week if they were icing the same exact roster they iced last week if cutter gochier was still a, a flyers prospect at college this would be a great week they won three out of four they lost to mm -hmm. pittsburgh monday night we sit here almost 10 minutes into the show and we haven't talked about the on ice at all because of how exciting this all is and a big part of the reason for that is jamie drysdale sure now we'll get to him in a little while because yes. we have to before you can get to the part that, that actually comes back and talk about what's here now, you obviously we got to do the layers of what, you know, whatever. And I literally have like different questions that are like segmented into this because the place to begin is what happened? How did we get here? Right. First and foremost. And you, you already alluded to it. Simply put, Cutter Gauthier made his intentions known that he was not going to sign with the Flyers or ever play for the Flyers. And he made that intention known apparently after world championships last may right and we in do know we, mm -hmm. we do know that that is a reversal from what he had said at the draft right we right. heard yes born to be a flyer built to be a flyer etc 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 so let me go through the timeline kind of from may and world championships to the present day when the trade happens because there's a lot of pieces just within that even without the trade portion right so this is pretty this is pretty fascinating, this part of it, because in the weeks and months that followed that meeting that they had where he tells them, I'm not going to play for you. The Flyers did two things. One, they kept it quiet to protect Gautier in the event that he changed his mind back. Mm -hmm. And they quietly shopped him to other teams on the condition that nothing gets out. Right. Also, in case he changes his mind and there was no trade to be made eventually. Right. So everything was like that, by the way, over the course of all of this time. And by the way, well, let's start with this. Also, the weeks and months that followed included the draft. Yep. They were quietly shopping him even at the draft. 
Yep. And nobody knew that. Rumors have come out since then that at some point in time they were they were talking to the Colorado <laughs> Avalanche about Bowen and Byram. Okay, so yeah, Friedman had that. Yeah. Charlie O'Connor had that they talked to Montreal and were going after the fifth in the past draft. Yep. So ironically, literally the same, like almost a lateral move from your fifth overall pick from 22 goes to Montreal and you get the fifth in 23 and that they were potentially going to take man you would have had five and seven wow. right but they were but that they were going to potentially take the do the exact same thing montreal did and take david reinbacher at five and ho, and then go for mishkov at seven and get both and then have a 20 have 22 as well crazy which 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 by the way at that point who the hell knows what they decide to do at 22 if they grab a defenseman at five Right. Like, obviously, they grabbed a defenseman at 22, but that was only because that was only after the only other thing you're getting in the first round is look at this potentially elite right. forward. If, if you're also getting a top five. Yeah. But if you're getting but if you're getting a top five and you pick a defenseman there, who knows if you go back and look at somebody else who's a forward at that point? Do you change completely change course? Like, who knows? Well, yeah. What, and what and we're not going to try to no, and they, like, and revise they, this. And they, they did, did still they get did. a top pair defenseman for this, so it doesn't potentially, you know, potentially yes. It like, sure looks every, that way. Well, no, well, everything is potential at this point. Yeah, That's the whole course, thing. Like it, we, you have to go with that. Regardless, over the course of all this time, Cutter Gauthier goes back to Boston College. He's playing in games, and everybody in the fan base naturally is assuming that any success that he's having is great for the flyers future because his future flyer he's, success because that's they have his rights this is who they drafted everything seems fine right like like you said we spent you know half hour last show talking about the world championships and how great he was right world, and, world juniors right so the the flyers on at least two notable occasions that have since been reported have well, one wasn't really reported, honestly. Like one of them, Danny Briere just flat out disclosed it or confirmed yep. it, you know, in the presser. So there's nothing to, there's no report at that point. The GM told you what happened with the one of them. But yeah. apparently in November, they sent John LeClaire and Patrick Sharp to Boston College. This, and this was, uh, per, this is according to Kevin Kerr's The Athletic had this in his yep. story. Um, and basically, after watching him play in a game and trying to meet with him, Gautier sent his coach back out to inform literally two ex flyers, two former Stanley Cup champions that know two, he's not meeting with them. Two NHL legends, period. Right. No, and says, No, I'm not meeting with you. Okay. Interesting. You know, that's certainly that's certainly an approach. So last week, literally, again, we're still trying to we're having the conversation about how great World Juniors is going. Yep. And Danny Briere and Keith Jones, and there's some mentions that I've heard where Patrick Sharp went again as well. God, they can All... just keep bringing the most handsome man alive. <laughs> it's, um, a good, it's a good PR strategy. <laughs> and so they said all three of these guys apparently go to Sweden now. Now, this is not like that. This isn't a trip to Boston College anymore. This is let's get on a flight internationally. Right. By the by the way, they left the road trip early. Well, right. And we're talking about they're in that. Western Canada. And we're talking about an asset, you know, a top five draft pick is worth sure. tens of millions of dollars to a franchise. Like, of course, they're going to try to rebuild the bridge and, sure. you know, so they get go, this kid to see the light. Sure. So they go to Sweden and, again, they watch him play and they try to have one last attempt at meeting with him because all that the, – and we'll we'll get into parts of this, but all that they wanted to do at that point was – you know, if things started to sour somewhere between roughly March and May, you know, he finally makes it known that he doesn't want to play after world championships. And that is definitely May, but obviously things had to sour before then. So if it's if the timeline that kind of keeps coming up is, well, something went south somewhere between March and May because the, the perceived notion is that when his season ended with Boston College as a freshman, he was like ready to turn pro potentially. Then the Flyers didn't want to do it at, like maybe at that time because then they had 16 games left. The contract rolls over a year. You burn a year on 16 games of a season where you're going to finish with a top 10 draft pick. They right. probably didn't feel great about doing that. Oh, by the way, two days before his season ended, Chuck Fletcher got fired. Right. That's right. another and part of it. So your front office is a mess at that given moment. Yeah. Like you're, you're trying to piece things together. Everything's a mess. You're not exactly thinking about, gee, you know, what's a great idea right now. Let's sign our top prospect and well, legitimately top prospect. Like obviously now right. after the draft last year, Mishkov became the top prospect, but you don't have, you don't have Mishkov in the system yet. So you're still trying to sort some stuff out. Um, 
So obviously somewhere like in the range where th things obviously soured or, or whatever, that was another part of the equation. The entire front office mostly has changed over. Sure. Okay. Look, we can go back and look and there's no, there's look, this is no stretch here. There's pictures of it. Danny Breer is on stage when Gautier is brought up and shakes his hand and all that stuff like that. There's a picture of it. I used it for a story um, yep. or used it for one of the other stories that went on sports talk Philly.com this week. I should say it wasn't one of mine, um, but beside the point. Um, so you can see that part, like Danny Briere is part of it, but when they drafted Cutter Gauthier, Keith Jones was still just a broadcaster and yep. Dan Hilford, he wasn't even in the picture yet. And you know, this, that, the other, there's a lot of other moving parts, but the only right. thing that you had at that point was Danny Briere as an advisor, like basically an advisor, special assistant, whatever the title was. And special assistant to, right, the, to the general yeah. manager yeah. 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 and well, John, it, and John Tortorella is the coach. That's all you've got. Well, it might just be that simple, right? Cutter Gauthier might have talked to Chuck Fletcher and been a Chuck Fletcher guy. And and when that changed and certain things changed about, you know, when maybe when he was joining the team or right. even, well, and it's, it and it's possible other that, things behind the scenes that we don't necessarily. Right. Well, think. and that's and that's the thing, too. Like, it's possible that maybe in his head somewhere he had an idea from when Chuck Fletcher was still here right. that there was a timeline that they were going to follow. And then now you got the whole thing changed Danny Briere sitting there going like I just I'm two days on the job here as an right. interim no less we don't have like we're not doing this right this minute like just you know whatever and listen guys just want like we've said this many times guys just yeah. want to play so yeah, if he so wants to play like he ends up having basically he ends up having to wait until world championship to play another game and that kind of by that point maybe something festers in it or whatever and, and there's no sense in going crazy over it but obviously he didn't take the meeting which brings us to the next one of the next questions okay. why trade him now and the reason is really simple well, because the, the, danny told you yeah well and the reason oh, i know the, but the reason is very simple also because after he was tied for the tournament lead with 12 points at world juniors not even playing to his typical goal scoring self and after being named one of the top forwards in the tournament they felt that the value was never going to be higher. This so was what, the opportunity. And for two reasons. One, he just showed on an, an international stage, look at what I can do, right? So, That's the first part. And then the second part is, is the longer it goes, they have at this point, and I, I, I don't know where I have this, if I have this put down for later discussion or whatever, but I will mention it now. This is the second time in recent memory that you can go back and look at this group of Flyers front office and find out that they were able to keep something under wraps, like and heavy under wraps. To do this for six months is basically well, almost unheard of. Right, to the point where there were, there were allegedly 18 to 20 teams involved at well, some at point. Least, at least that maybe inquired about of it. Course. I don't know how many were really serious but about how, it. But How many things happen in 18 NHL front offices and nobody hears a word about it. Sure. Well, and that and that's why also why now because the longer you wait, the more likely it is that it eventually gets out. If it gets out, yep. they have no leverage and that would really ruin the situation. They would probably come away with close to nothing compared to what the situation was. So that's the whole what happened portion of this. Oh, and the other everything... the other timeline thing there. I don't think you mentioned it. He did skip development camp. Well, I, I think I'm getting, I think, well, I, okay, I think okay, I'm going to okay. get into that later because like, okay, we'll get in. I know he did, but like, th th and that, I was just trying to get to the part well, where I just, things I just want to get like, to Jamie Drysdale as quickly as possible. Oh, That's I know. Well, well, unfort to... Unfortunately, it's not that simple with this. <laughs> unfortunately, we're going to spend way more time than we probably want to on Cutter Gauthier and less yeah. on Jamie Drysdale to start with. We'll have, we'll, look, we'll have plenty of weeks and shows ahead to talk about Jamie Drysdale a lot. I'm oh, sure, yeah. but right now we have to talk about Cutter Gauthier because that's this is the last that we're really going to talk about him other than when he's an opponent. Oh, until the first time he comes back. Sure. Boy, so, we're going to talk about it then. Okay, so we just did what happened and why make the trade now. Now the, now the next question, and this is the one with the most speculation, the one with all this kind of stuff. Why wouldn't Cutter Gauthier sign? And I will start this right off the bat, and I'll say what I said throughout the course of the week because this is – this is really where everybody's got to get their headspace, I think, eventually. That at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. No, that the, that the true reason is ultimately known by Cutter Gautier and those closest to him. And, and, that, unlikely and, that, to be is, known and that is and that is the way it's probably going to be. Yeah. That said, the lack of an answer is going to lead towards all sorts of conspiracy theories. So I'm hashing out a few of these and just bear with me as I read some of these off. All this is relevant information hey, to the course, be, especially be to careful the course. with what you say. John Tortorella might come after you in a press. No, 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 no. I, be careful. Just, just, be careful oh, no, no, no. Why do you think this is his button? up as it is for this show I know, all right I know. 
So let's start with this. There was the possible. We already discussed this part. There was the possibility that the timelines didn't match up from what Gautier had in mind. Like it seems now that maybe the Flyers weren't necessarily pushing for Gautier to go back to college as much. Like maybe they were literally trying to buy time for can we get the regular season over with and then we'll right. talk. And right. even then, that might be out of what he had in mind. You know, apparently the decision to go back to school was much more made by the you know his. his everybody his team of advisors college coaches the fact that they had a freshman class like they do coming in we literally i said it last week i didn't think it, like assuming everything was go, was going the way that we thought it was until monday he wasn't going to play for the team anyway unless they made the playoffs this year because right. i think boston college probably wins the whole damn thing so okay and i just mentioned the thing with the, the 16 games left okay so that meant if he signed they burn a year the front office problems blah 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 um i also kind of have this belief that the Flyers may have looked to delay this a little bit so that you lined, and I brought this up, I think, on a couple different other things, where you line up the ELCs between Gautier and Mishkov a little bit. It yes. opens the door for, I think it opens the door for in three years. If Mishkov's over here after his three years in Russia on the current contract is up, you spend, like, okay, you make it known that he's playing in with in the NHL the following year. You go big in free agency. Like, you open Absolutely. the door for, and now we start signing people because that's the way that it is. Um that's what we all looked at. You know, we right, all sure. looked at that window, that three-year summer. You know, now, and of course, like, as this thing progressed, like, the idea was maybe delay that, because that really delays it. That would give them one year with both on ELCs. Maybe you pull back on that even. How, like, because, let's put it this way. Briere said this when he went on, I think he said it on when he went on the Jeff Marrick show, um, that they watched the way he played at world championships. They go, look at this seven goals. He's playing against th th these are NHL veterans. He's playing against in turn. Like, and this isn't the juniors. This is world guys, championships. guys with real, right. Yeah. He looks really good. And you start to think maybe he is actually ready. Like instead of thinking, no, he, he could, maybe the other year of college could be good for him. We'll, we'll let him do that. Wherever it's like, no, nah, maybe we need to talk to him. So maybe they he's too good for college. Right. right. So they actually started to prepare themselves when they were going to have it. Cause by this point now you're, when world championships end, you're past the point of, of all the mess with the front office to an extent. Like Danny Breer is the GM officially. Heath Jones is the president of hockey operations. Hilford, he's taken over kind of the ownership role a little bit. Things are actually in a really good place. They've had their new era press conference. There's at least a structure in place and you're waiting to see what they do, obviously, but there's a structure in place. So there's a little less. So Breer was under the, said that they, they were basically under the impression when they got the meeting with Gautier in May after world championships, that he was going to sit there and say, I don't want to go back to college. I want to turn pro. And they were ready. To, they were pretty much ready to go with contract in hand. They were going to sign him if that was the way that he if that was the way he wanted to go. And instead, Gautier dropped a bomb on it and said, I don't want to be a flyer. And yep. so now now we get to the part where everything really gets sketchy, because that was at least because, again, when Briere's talking about it, Briere is going to tell you we were prepared to sign him after world championships. That's a lot more information than somebody telling you this is what the report is and somebody right. said this or said that Briere went on a show and told you they were ready to sign the guy if, if that's a lot out. more than he has to tell you yeah oh, Briere has been a, a, full marks to Danny Briere for being as transparent as he was through the whole process Man, the whole organization has been pretty transparent oh we'll get to that too don't you worry that's the next that's literally the next part of this conversation so let's get over let's really quick hash through these so-called conspiracy theories because there's so many of them that kind of eventually like it, it so doesn't matter at the end of the day anyway let's just talk this over really quick because there was a belief there was a belief that he didn't want to play for john tortorella he denied it his agent denied it there was the whole kevin hayes angle of this and listen uh, this is my comment on the kevin hayes angle did he have a relationship with kevin hayes like, did they stay connected? Sure, of course they did. Players talk and players are observant. It's up to them to make their own impressions of things. But of course, you're, you you have a connection in one way or oh. another. You're going to reach out to people and you're just going to talk. It doesn't mean that you listen to it by, like gospel or whatever and, and things like that. And, and that's why when you think about that kind of connection, like, is it possible that Hayes has something to do with it? Of course it is, because Gautier went on a podcast like a year ago and said, Hayes took him golfing. They text on occasion. Like, yeah, it's possible that they talked. Right. And the connection exists, but let's not act like an active NHL player in the middle of his career is going out of his way to contact this kid daily to say, don't sign with them. No, of course. And that's ridiculous. Is, and this is also my time to insert this week's version of, hey, don't be weird on the Internet. 
No death threats. Well, threat. we'll get to that. Don't don't death threat Kevin Hayes. Don't death threat. Oh, Kurt I Gauthier. have that part down. Yeah, it's hockey. Like at the end of the day, I know you love your team. I love them too. It's hockey. Relax. Uh, exactly. And that's anyway, where I was. Moving on. Uh, no, but that's where I was going to go with it because, like, listen at the at the end of the day, too, guys. We just said I said this earlier. Guys just want to play. And so sometimes you're going to put up with crap from a coach or you're going to go through the struggles of a rebuild or you're going to play the dirty minutes on a third line when you got first line potential because it's part of the process. And you get to say for even those years, I'm an NHLer, you know, you deal with it. It didn't end well in Philadelphia for Kevin Hayes. Right. We've documented that. And we know the role that John Tortorella had in that to some extent, obviously. Of course. And listen, much like what's going on with Gautier. If you want to view Hayes as a little bit of a villain and boo him when he plays in Philly, every time he touches the puck, be my guest. That's the competitive nature of the game in terms of, you know, hey, you, there's guys who eventually, like you sit there and you go, I don't like this person anymore as a player because he didn't want to be on my team or he or whatever or whatever happened with my team. And that's why I don't like him. Right. Like, for God's sake, even Crosby dropped that line once. Sidney Crosby dropped that line of I just don't like him. Well, then we don't have to like you back. You know what I mean? Like that uh, kind of thing, right? No, but, and no kidding. But the, the death way, threats and that Hayes yeah. and Gautier both said they were receiving, like, give me a break. Uncalled for it. Don't do that. Just stop. It's hockey. Yeah. It's a game. And I get that we get caught up in competition and that nature of things, but there's a line that shouldn't be crossed. And that goes so far beyond that line. So, and this is the last I have to say on anything with the reasoning behind yep. it. As hard as it is, the reason is going to stay between Gautier and his inner circle. Yep. It's been kept so close to the vest that by Gautier and, and for him that not even Danny Briere really knows the reason and has said that multiple times. So well, and ultimately, I, think that's, I think that's part of the reason that I think that's part of the reason that you saw the response in the media that you did from the team is mm -hmm. that Danny Briere's feelings are hurt. The organization's feelings are hurt. Well, and that's sure. why immediately within minutes keith jones is on the broadcast if sure. you don't want to be a flyer you're not going to be a flyer exactly and that's uh, exactly where i wanted to go next because yep. now we need to go to the reactionary side of things with, within that, minutes danny briere is at the press conference saying essentially the same thing like that was the that kind was the of uh, like, for a couple of days there. right and and look th this is the part that sucks about the situation because if gotier doesn't want to be a flyer they trade a top prospect in the middle of a rebuild and he's not happy with the direction of the team or the recurring issues he claimed he didn't like or whatever, at least have the courtesy to speak to the flyers on that. Of course. You don't, it doesn't even have to go public. Like, there's a way to do this where the explanation becomes, you know, Gautier's explanation is, I just want to keep all this private. And Briere's is, he told us the reasons, but out of respect and for we're his decision, going to keep it private. we're not going to disclose this. Right. Right. The end. End of story. You're done. And if, and and if that happens, everyone goes, oh, man, that's a bummer. OK, good luck. Right. Now, you can still at that point in time, it's not like it's not like speculation is going to stop. People are still right. going to try to guess. But it's I think instead of being like, well, of course, you're like you're left guessing now. And in this day and age of social media and the Internet and all oh, that, there it's will not be only speculation. it's not only going to get discussed, but it will get overblown. And and maybe it would be less overblown if it was done the, the previous way where it's like, OK, both sides say it's it's going to be kept private, but at least the team knows the reason. And no, they and feel like they can move forward with it a little more. Instead, that, it's we sent John LeClaire to Boston and he wouldn't and he meet didn't with talk. Them. Right. And he didn't talk. We, flew, we, we took we, right, flew we to, flew Sweden to Sweden and, and he, he wouldn't, wouldn't talk meet with us. us. Right. Yeah. That, and and, that, and that, look, it looks bad. For, it looks bad in a lot of ways, too, because it looks bad for Gautier, too. Like. Sure. It's unfortunate, like and it's I, unfortunate I, that it does. But and I think the Flyers did a great job of making it look bad for Gauthier. Well, they did. I'm not going to deny that part of it. I don't. I don't. I don't see anything. The second they really... dumped, the second they dumped the asset, they stopped. Not stopped entirely, but in a majority of ways, they stopped protecting the asset. Well, and there's and there and believe me, there's a group of and I'm I'm saying this tongue in cheek, and I'm not saying it about the Flyers version of this, but there's a. If, if you saw the athletic this weekend, you know, there's a portion of the old boys club out there that didn't love the way that was handled. Okay. Have they watched the Vegas Golden Knights operate at all <laughs> over the last four or five years? So, like we, we just trade everybody. Well, we well, uh, no, 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 no. The part that people didn't seem like was not the part about somebody getting traded. It was the, the media go, box? no, because it was the part. It was basically exactly what you're talking about. To go from well, we're going to protect him just in case he changes his mind. To never mind, you're traded now. Here, by the way, if you don't want to be a flyer, you're not going to be, and like all that stuff. And it's like, so what's maybe, the problem with that though? 
I don't know. Maybe it's just because I work in sales, but I don't know. You made a good sale. You got it. You got well, a good here's, value. Here's the other part of it. Since since when? You know, or like, in, I mean, and you know what I mean when I say that. Since when? It's Philadelphia Flyers you're talking about. If Ed Snyder was Absolutely. alive, he would have been on something. Oh, and the thing this week that I I didn't know if I would ever see a professional athlete climb the list the way Cutter Gauthier climbed the list this week, and this <laughs> list. This list I'm talking has names like J.D. Drew on it and Ben Simmons (laughs) and guys who just across this town are just not liked. And I don't know if it will stick with Cutter Goche his entire career. If he's got a good shot to if he keeps acting the way he does about the Philadelphia situation, it probably will. He's going to get booed every time he touches the puck. Of course, the Flyers have a rivalry with the Anaheim Ducks now. That you, never in a million years did you think you were going to say those words, right? And, and it's not even really with the Ducks because... It, no, it's with one guy. It's with one dude. Yeah, right. but you know, you know how it works. The first time they play, somebody will hit somebody. There'll be a fight here. It's going to be a nasty game, and then the rivalry will just kind of spiral so, out there. So let's let's put it this way. And I, I already talked about... The, there's two things I found... Or there's a couple things I found impressive. Like, I already mentioned the one part that I found impressive about what the Flyers did, which is keeping the whole thing quiet. Because obviously the other example that we have of this in recent memory is the whole, hey, Matt Vemishka, I've got a private tour of the facility and nobody knew. And then, you know, a few days later, he's a flyer and he wants to be a flyer. And then, by the way, this is opposite ends of the spectrum kind of thing here. Yeah, totally is invested in this idea. I'm very impressed with how upper management has well, because, handled Well, because it was one of the biggest criticisms we had for so long was like, listen, what's the deal with this front office? Well, you know, it's, it, there's so much it, the miscommunication even within, right? Like they couldn't, that, even, they couldn't even get on board with the same messaging to the that, fans. That that leads me to, to something here, Kevin. Sure. And then I want to get to one more thing yeah. before we actually turn the page and get to some of the other no, stuff. No, entirely. So – We've been talking all season about mm-hmm. this team and how sure. something feels different. And I wonder, maybe this is just how it was supposed to be the whole time. Maybe maybe this is the end result that Ron Hextall was building towards. And <laughs> when you fire Chuck Fletcher and you essentially reset the corporate structure for everybody above John Tortorella, at that mm-hmm. point, right? All the way up to Dan Hilferty. Right. You put... Th- I think addition by subtraction is the theme for the season. We've talked about it on the roster with Kevin Hayes, with Ivan Provorov, with Tony D'Angelo. Right. I don't think we've talked about enough how much we addition by subtraction to the front office. Sure. And, and you, I, re- I, you remove all of this influence on all of these names, and I'm not going to go through all of that again, but you remove all of that and you install new people but they're, with a fresh way. And I know they're still there and they're still honoring well, history. Uh, no, but right. But that's the thing. There was a there was a way and they kind of figured out the way to allow them to be there without allowing like full disclosure, by the way, because another key component of this. And I want to make sure that I get this yeah. right as we go through. But we haven't heard all year long. Right. Pretty much like honestly, all year long. It's like, yeah, OK. Are they around? Sure, they are. All the same people are still around, right? Like Bobby Clark. Bobby Clark is coming to games on occasion. Bill Barber's they, around on ga- occasion. They just trotted everybody that. out for the Snyder anniversary last well, week. Well, no, right. Well, they did, but they, yeah. they're, they're there in general. Like if, no, if, of course, if of they're course. around, they're around. There's another advisor, another senior advisor that was rel- I think was pretty recently added. Okay. Bob Murray. Okay. You know who Bob Murray worked for before? No, the Anaheim Ducks. <laughs> so when the Flyers are trying to figure out what do we do about this situation, they literally went to the general manager of the team that drafted the player they were getting and said, what do you think? And obviously he, he said, signed off and said, absolutely, I like him. Yeah. I like him. So they had an opportunity to get that player. And then, you know, so there's still a level of involvement. But you know what? That's a resource that you do go to when a team is putting a player who was picked in the top 10 also on the table and saying, we will actually do this. This is available. You. We yeah. will trade you this player. He's 21 years old. This never, by the way, this never happens. You right. don't see oh, no. 19, 20 year old prospect get traded for 21 year old NHL ready defenseman, right. you know, because something's right, not right handed defenseman. Right. And because something's not working out somewhere else, by the way. You know what I mean? Like, right. 
you, this you is never a, see this. This is, this is a very strange change of scenery. So this right? is a, right. So this is actually kind of an interesting scenario where you know what? You, this is where you do want some senior advisors around to be like, let's run an idea by you. Of course. Because because this is different. This is not influencing day to day and how we're gonna do things and all that. No, this was a I need to consult you because you you drafted this kid. What do we think here? I, I need more info. But I just and, mean in general, I think the reset on the front office, I think this is where the team should have been the whole time. Right. Probably. Like you yeah. had the Chuck Fletcher uh let's call it experiment. And <laughs> and I think that tanked a lot of your your curve, right? You were on the Hextall curve and you were on the way up. And then Chuck Fletcher kind of plateaued it for a while and dropped it. But then it comes back and all of these guys, all of this talent is still there, still floating around, right? Joel Farabee's still there. All is it these guys. Is it reasonable to call four plus seasons an experiment? When I know I'm joking with you. I well, just love I loved your choice of words right. for Chuck Fletcher. But. Of course. But when you when you deviate from that experiment and immediately go back to success. Well, they went back to something that they were familiar with, too. They went back to your – you like, and I, look, I know people kind of were rolling their eyes at this a little bit because it kind of we, – like we even said, boy, the commitment to the bid is really strong here. But when you go back to you're part of the family and we trust you to do the right things to help this continue to be successful, maybe that's just the wheelhouse. You know, like maybe it's just the right call sometimes is that they, they get – look, at least you went with – instead of going with like like – and I'm not trying to say they would actually have considered this per se, but like for, for real, they could have turned around and said, you know what? We need a president. We need a, a GM. Hey, Paul Holmgren, do you want to do this for right now? And like, and revisited something really old. No, they got two younger people who are newer to the whole thing. And I get that Keith Jones never had a front office position and Briere had gone through the ranks, but it's like Keith Jones knows so much about the game in general from broadcasting it that you go, that's a guy who at least I know has his pulse on the whole the league in terms of where it should be, what you should get to be better. And by the way, and we'll get into this part when we start talking about Drysdale more. How do you, how did he say all along that we're going to build it? We're going to build from the back end. So they go out and they get a defenseman who's twenty one and a right handed shot. Do you not think that that's having a pulse on where the game? And he's mobile. Yeah. Can we finally talk about Jamie Drysdale? I, I will in one second because okay. there's one other part of this I want to mention while we're on the front office thing and kind of the restructuring because that was the one other thing that I found super impressive. Yeah. Was everybody having the same message across the board? You know, that if you don't want to be a flyer, you're not going to be. And we don't want you. Keith Jones, the, this could have stopped at Danny Briere speaking after the first period. Nobody else yep. has to do anything for the rest of the night. You're that you're sending Briere out to do the press conference for the media. That's exactly the point of it. But to put Keith Jones on the broadcast and say, we're going to talk about, I'm going to go on and talk about this. And sure. Is there a little bit of a nod to Jonesy knows what he's doing when he has a microphone and is on camera? Right. Sure. With, with Jim Jackson. <laughs> right. Sure. But he went out and made a definitive statement. If you don't want to be a flyer, you're not going to be. Well, oh, the, that sure the, resonated. The and then team, the team went full blown. No one likes us. We don't. They did. But here's the other part of it. So this was and this was the biggest. This was really the biggest one to me. So Jonesy said that on the you know on the TV broadcast, yep. Danny Briere's best jab at Gautier as but because you know, he was really buttoned up with it, knew what to say, was transparent about what happened. Danny Briere. Right. But his best jab was kind of tongue in cheek. The multiple mentions of well, we saw him as a winger. Yeah. Like, like you know, yeah. Maybe you it's did. Maybe a, you did. Petty, but you're gonna say petty that. little jab, right? But you're gonna say that because that's the way it was. They but, drafted a center slash so, winger, and they traded right. a but winger. So, but so Danny Bre or Danny Breer, Dan Hilferty goes on Snow the Goalies press row show. Also, this is at the same. By the way, at the same time that Jonesy's on TV. Yep. I think they said Dan sent Danny Breer down to the radio booth too. By the way, during that, so so Breer just did the big press conference thing at the first intermission. The second intermission was. All three of them went on different things to say the same thing. And but but Hilferty really press. had but Hilferty to me, because his quote was something about I'm like because Hilferty said, like, I'm gonna feel like I feel sorry for him, but I don't feel sorry for him when he comes back because he oh. made this decision. Like, this is what he decided. And if you don't, we want people who want to be here, right? He he made his bed, and when he returns to Philadelphia, he will lie in it. But yeah. what Dan Hilferty did in that moment was basically have an Ed Snyder moment. He sure did. He, he you know, yep. the, you, the look on his face as he's saying that is it, it, like that. And that that's a big moment for the front office, like from an ownership standpoint, because people like I understand if you don't like the idea that it's still under the umbrella of Comcast owns the team. But you've got a person here who's going to show up and he's there all the time. That's I've been 
I've been spouting good news about Dan Hilferty since by the, the way he signed on. By the way, the next day he went to practice. Okay. Like so, Hilferty I, does that on like on camera. They're doing the show on which is uh, which is on YouTube, obviously. So like it's not on television per se. But he has a moment, and not, not naturally that was clipped. It was gonna go like I put it in a story because it's like this is a big moment f- involving Hilferty because f- this is the first like Dave Scott would never you know Dave kind Scott of thing, would right? Never. So so you've got somebody who's standing as from an ownership level who's putting his foot down, saying this way you want this is the way you want it to be. This is the way it's gonna be, and I feel sorry that it didn't work out, but I don't feel sorry for when you come back because. This is how it's going to be in Philly, and we want people who want to be here, right? And that that whole thing. He went to practice the next day and is doing the same thing, going around to fans, shaking hands, saying thank you for being here, thank you for supporting us, all that kind of stuff. He is turning into a key figure in this thing fast. And, oh, by the way, I'm sure you've seen by now the cover of the hockey news in the last month. Yeah. It's the, it's the three of them. Yep. This is get used to it. This is what you're going to see a lot of for right now. These are the three people who are going to be most responsible for where this thing goes. And you better believe that if they come out of this on the other side and win something significant over the course of the next, say, 10 years, yep, it's going to have a lot to do with the three of them. Oh, so, yeah. But you so that's, know, that's a big thing. So, so after they, Hilferty, by the way, so after Hilferty, well, they, they may be responsible for a lot, but they weren't responsible for the best quote on Monday night. Well, we'll get, I'm getting to it. Okay. Um, so, because after Hilferty, Torts was Torts. You yeah, know, he I don't, was. I don't, I don't know Cutter from a hole in the wall. You know, yeah, I uh, know. Hey, um, you, uh, you, you met Cutter. Like, what did you say? I don't know. I don't know Cutter. Nope. Well, even down to like, so what's your response to whatever it was? Then we don't want you here. Yep. Done. <laughs> yep. And and like and that's Torts being Torts, obviously. But this one, okay, this was the other one that was most impressive me. If Hilferty was one of the top ones for me, because because you know, like let's this way, he didn't have to do anything. Right. He could have just sat in a box and been like, okay, you guys handle it. This is your job. This is president of hockey ops and GM kind of stuff. Not me. I don't need to go out and do this right now. And he still did. But the next most impressive one, even Travis Sanheim brought up how guys in the room heard about him not wanting to come to development camp and kind of like steady goes that stayed with them. And if yep. somebody doesn't want to be here, we're happy to move on with somebody who does. And he said something. So the players the- are saying it. All I know is that. You know, you show up to development camp, whether you skate or not. Right. And so even the players are united on it, which just goes to show you how tight this all is right now. This is yeah. as, like, like it was we, we've gone from so disjointed a year ago, like just absolute shambles to yep. what this is now. It is beyond encouraging that this is the way that they're able to unite in terms of messaging. They might not be the best team in the league, no. even though they even though they can beat the best team in the league sometimes. But they've like. Well, but they, this, they've at least done that, you know, done that for themselves is that they've and, buttoned up this message so well that everybody's on the same page and you and you've got to love that for them. And they've done enough that your GM went out there and yes, added let's finally to, get to and added to your current roster. We talked recently about, you know, maybe there's an upgrade here or there and maybe they do a little bit of shuffle and to try to if they're in a playoff spot when it gets close to the deadline. And Danny Briar went, nope, here's a 21-year-old stud, top six pick t- right-handed defense. Right. Go. So before we talk about Drysdale specifically, we do have to talk about, obviously, now, like the move being what it is, what does it mean for the rebuild process? And Because on one hand, you're bringing back a defenseman that could potentially be on your top pair. And he's yeah. got that level of potential, whether it happens or not, obviously, you, you look, things are unpredictable. You don't know. And... But like it's not like you traded Cutter Gautier and ended up with a few like a couple middle of the pack prospects or even a first round pick. Like even if you got a first round pick back as the headlining piece, you still don't know where that goes and you have to wait to see where it goes. You, you know, got quality for quality. Here. Right. Like like you could get back a first round pick and it'd be 2025. Think about that. Yeah. And then you're waiting over a year to figure out what you even get for this. They got a player effective yeah. immediately. Play two it's... nights later. Right. I don't like this is my take on it. I don't think it changes the timeline that drastically one way or another, because on one hand, I think adding a defenseman to the roster right away. First of all, this is as close as you're going to see to buying move this season Uh, for now, for now. I know I don't see them buying like that, not with because here's the difference. They didn't have to give up something current or like or future beyond a guy who didn't want to play here to improve it now. You know what I mean? Like. 
if you're if your back's against the wall and the and the prospect is saying I'm never going to sign with you, never going to play with you, you could just as easily ride the thing out for four years of his college career, like most teams do, and then get nothing for it afterwards, except for a, what a compens- compensatory second round pick. Is what you get when the guy doesn't sign, like something like that. But, yeah. but, but you're going to also waste two years of a rebuild in the process to let him go through junior and senior year before you like before ultimately it falls apart. No, you just took action. You just did what you had to do. That's why I think it's as close to a buying move as you're going to see, because most buying moves are going to revolve around what picks do you have? And I don't think that now that they've got, I mean, they've got four picks in the first two rounds this year, and they've got three next year. I'm just why saying. would you trade? Why would you trade any of that for maybe one round of a playoff appearance right now? I, like to me, and I say maybe, and, and I'm not trying to diminish what they've done on the season. Sure. But this is that's equally as important. Well, like you could you could have immediate think, success in the rebuild and still build for the future with your offseason. And I think you can still add and not necessarily trade any of your premium picks. Like, for example, would you trade Nick Sealer and a third to add, you know, a quality third line winger? I mean, sure, that, sure. that if, sort of thing. If somebody's right willing now, to, if somebody's willing to go there, sure. I just don't as, know how many are going to be willing to go there. As I mean, of well, right now, you have. Eight defensemen. So you do you right. I do want to get to have to make a move there. Sure, and I do want to get to that in one second. Like because uh, obviously, because on the other hand, basically, like let let's let's not ignore the biggest defi- deficiency now. They basically have no center prospects. No, no. Like especially none that are high end talent. No, but like, like they just don't have that. You, like and, I mentioned, and you were, like I mentioned on last week's show, though Noah Cates returning from injury is gonna feel a lot like a mid season. Well, that part, yes, yeah. that will feel like an acquisition. Of course, it will. Um. And at this point in time, that's that's getting more and more exciting with where sure. the team's at. You were, but let's so let's be like, but you were forced into trading pretty much the one high end talent center level player that you and, and what in look, North obviously, America. Well, 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 and ob, well, no, no center because well, that's fair. Mishkov's more of a like, Mishkov already is is a winger. That is true. Yeah. So, um, and look again, de- it depends on if Gauthier ends up as a center or a winger ultimately. But regardless, you're going back to the drawing board on this, and truthfully. It could be years before you end up with another player of that quality via the draft. Because let's pay, let's face it, they're not picking top ten this year. The way this is going, oh no, absolutely not. So, they're a top so, ten team in the league. They're wait, on the other so, side of no, so well, sure, but what does that mean? It means that you're let's like you're definitely not getting Macklin Celebrini, and you're not getting basically the no. only other three prospects that are that are remotely close to being like. And Florida's good too. So your other first right. so, this year is not well, going to be there. If you go look at draft boards right now. If you want to get another defenseman, you got a great shot at it because it's loaded with defensemen. Centerman, not so much. Mm. So I'm starting, like, I almost wonder if finding a guy to take over the role that Sean Couturier has doesn't just happen through free agency eventually versus the draft. Like, okay. just like just because uh, I, I genuinely think you could be waiting for upwards of five years to both draft slash develop the player who becomes worthy of that role. Or you could literally just let the timeline play out, keep trying to build everything else, and then go, hey, when the time comes, make sure we have money. Right. Literally, quite literally. Like, yeah. that's about it. Um, Because otherwise, and this goes back to your point, like, yeah, first of all, they got eight defensemen on the roster at the moment to start with. But let me play another game with you on this, because let's just go through this list of younger defensive talent that they have and take out certain guys who are actively on the roster for a minute. Because I'll, I'll, and I'll even, like, I'm even including Travis Sanheim in the NHL, re- like, obviously he's NHL ready. He's an NHL veteran, but he's, yeah. but he's on, but he's on the younger scale. Like he's 27. He, he could very well be the, especially with the comment that he made, that was very leadership of him. So I just put him up in the leadership group among all these other guys. And then add in now, Cam York, Jamie Drysdale, Igor Zamula, Ronnie Adder's in the minors, Adam Jennings in the minors, Emil Andre's in the minors. Oh yeah. You drafted one of these, you know, another defenseman in the first round last year, Oliver Bonks and juniors. Yep. Like that's eight. That could be part of your future. And you only like this was like you can only dress six, so you know what that means. It means you're going to have leverage to do something with guys who are expendable down the road too. And Absolutely. and this doesn't even factor in. What about Rasmus Ristolainen, who's got yeah. some time on his contract left? He's been decent. Yeah, maybe yeah, he stays. Maybe he stays in the picture. You the one. Guess what? The one common denominator between most of these guys, maybe Sanheim excluded in this, because Sanheim's certainly not 
a short guy by any stretch, but right. But York, Drysdale, Zamul is not as t- not as tall. Andre is incredibly short. Bonk is not going to be like the most oversized guy. You don't really have a ton of size, so maybe you keep wrist aligning around for a little. Say be the be the guy who bangs people around so that the other five can go do their job. Yeah, you wish he wasn't making more than five million dollars for that role. But, no, but that's you know, going to age. Contract that's gonna, signed, and that's going to age well with the cap going up, so it's oh, not as right. bad. No, you know, that's fair. You do ask yourself what happens to Sean Walker because Walker now becomes even more expendable than before because now you will originally you were like it's it's tough to trade him now because like that's the rest of your top four for now. I hear like as long as you're Mm. theoretically a playoff team, it's hard to move Sean. Yeah, but yeah, but think about something. If you go back to the eventually, if you go back to twelve six because they've been playing eleven seven for a while. If you go back to twelve six, Mark Stahl's still your seven at that point. And you could basically get away with, yeah. you know, you could get away with Sandheim, Drysdale, York, and you know, York Sealer, and Bristoline and Zamula, yeah. and say and say roll that, and it's probably not that bad. But you know, okay, so here's the thing: I've seen them roll in eleven seven, and I've right. seen. Okay, so the Oilers were doing it last year, and they right. were doing and they were doing it last year because when your fourth line wingers jumped out, Connor McDavid jumped out on the ice one shift, and then Leon Drysdale jumped out on the ice next shift, and they were just double shifting those guys as the fourth line center. Pretty much. Obviously, the Flyers aren't quite as deep or as talented enough to be able to do that. But I don't necessarily mind the 11-7 because you kind of just get it, stick a different center with those wingers. And the rotation with the seven defensemen hasn't been too bad. It hasn't been bad. And I agreed with it in the immediate because there was nobody who deserved to come out from the right. group of six. It's going to wear quickly if you keep playing like this because okay. then you're pushing, then you're really putting a lot of weight on the minutes of can Couturier play that long? And like, let's not ignore the fact that Couturier basically didn't play for two years. Like, right. If you like, you've like at this point in time, and now they've played what? Because they're past the halfway point. I think it's 43 games in. You're past the halfway point. You continue to do something that nobody had on the radar. If you really want to dive into this thing, then don't run your top line center who hadn't played for two years into the ground. Now, that is true. Don't do, don't true. do it. So give yourself a chance to balance it, especially when you're running the gauntlet of Jan, the, the January schedule. There's not a lot of time off. Like, right. and, and look, you can give Sean Couturier maintenance days every day of the week, you know, and twice on Sunday if you want to. Oh, you know, and kind of, on you know, Saturday night against Winnipeg. But, uh, yeah, I hear you. Um, you can do that all you want to. It's still going to add up when you get to March and April if you want to continue to push at that time, too. Especially because at that point you're gutting for, right. Right. Exactly. Yep. Do we, so I think that covers the defensive core and, and, and the Let's, deficiencies at center or whatever. Do we want to talk about Jamie Drysdale? Absolutely. Jamie Drysdale, a uh, former Erie Otter, uh, drafted sixth overall in 2020 by the Anaheim Ducks, right handed defenseman, 5'11, 185 pounds, 21 years old. Kevin, I'm excited, man. Sure, I have well, not. I, I've been excited for some Flyers prospects in the past. If you've been listening to the show long enough, you know, Sam Moran. Sure. <laughs> um, but Jamie Drysdale is a top six pick. And every single scouting report, every single thing you read about this kid talks about how incredibly elite top level his skating is. Oh, it is. He's incredibly, he's a great skater and incredibly mobile. We, we, is, on, uh, is he everything we wanted Shane Goss to spare to be? Possibly. I mean, I, okay. I, I, I kind of want to see him pull off the head fake move to the right a little bit kind of thing to really drive it home. And he, he got the puck in Minnesota in that situation. And I'm like almost half expecting him to try that. I know. Just, you know, all right, I'll just, you know, do the shoulder fake and kind of get you, you know, get the guy in front of me out of his skates for just a, just a split second, just so I can move around him and then set something up. No, I mean, he didn't go up. No, but did, did you see the, um, the entry he had on the one power play where he just I did. circled the zone and I uh, like, I'm, I'm sitting there going, okay, Peter Forsberg buys all of a sudden, like, man, yeah. you know, like, just, I don't like, even the way it was. I never played the game. I don't know skating on that level because, like, it's skating's crazy. I could tell that that skating was ridiculous. Sure. Well, the one thing I this is what I was going to say to you to kind of kickstart this whole thing off is I've done a few different things throughout the course of the week. Obviously, pretty much all of them were Tuesday. Okay. So this is with this is without the benefit of most of the fans getting a chance to actually watch him play, other than going off of the Anaheim experience. And you know how much I watch a lot of other stuff. I mean, even watching Anaheim games at 1030 at night, sometimes Right. it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a sickness, but that's okay. Um, 
I do remember two things very, very specifically about him. You know, I like, I, I know he's a good skater and that's like, that's the one thing I could definitely tell you about him coming in that you're going to like, you're going to see this guy skate and you're going to be really impressed. And, and believe me, I haven't seen him in person a lot. I, like, obviously I did this week, so I haven't seen him in person a whole lot. Um, prior to this, um, it's, it was even more impressive to watch in person, obviously. Like it, I entirely he, believe that it's effortless what he's able to do. By the um, way, I did, did want to mention, I will have the chance to see him in person on Monday night. I'll be in St. Louis like section 303. Hopefully as long as the illness clears if he, up, if he plays. Yeah. Uh, Un- that was cause that was unfortunate. Um, one thing I will tell you for sure in turn, cause if you recall, and we talked about, we talked about this on the show when it happened last, not last, but like the October before October of 2022. I happened to go to California right at the start of the season. Yes, you and did. happened to take in a Ducks game. Um, their season opener, no less. And the thing was, is that as bad as they had been throughout the course of the last several years, they had a lot of young players in there. And like, sure, you know, Zegris is a highlight. And Troy Terry had, a, you know, certainly has, you know, has a love from the fan base out there and things like that. And there's, you know, all that. There was a lot said about, you know, Drysdale and what people hoped he would be and how people really liked him. And, and if you want, if you want any impression of the difference between playing hockey in Anaheim and, and hockey in Philadelphia, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy this story. Okay. Um, so we cover his first game. He plays against, uh, plays against Montreal, Montreal. on Wednesday night yep. and has an assist. Well, has an assist. Oh, by the way, so by the way, he hasn't done anything yet. He, the, the, the team is just taking the ice to start the game. They're just announcing starting lineups. They announce his name in the starting lineup, and you would swear it was like they signed Connor McDavid for man. That day. building was loud. I told they you went that nuts. that building would be buzzing, and you said, "Oh, I don't know, maybe we'll see." It, it was and still it a late arriving. Was. It was still a really late arriving crowd. It was just weird. Like it felt honestly, I was shocked by how warm ups looked at first because I'm just like, "Wow, it doesn't. Just, it just doesn't seem like it's as big as what I thought it was going to be." It did fill out really well. I will give yeah. it, like absolutely. Yeah, that building was that um, was the loudest I've. I've heard they, that building during the week in a couple of so, years. So they cheer for him like crazy just for his just for mentioning him in the starting lineup. Then they get a power play and they scored like 20 seconds into the power play, 27 yep. seconds and something power like plays that. looked really good since he's been on the team. I'm just saying. Well, uh, we'll get into that. They've scored in four straight games. That's I'm something. Saying. Um, so obviously they announced that he got an assist. The place goes nuts. Um, there was also a chant that kind of broke out in the upper deck uh, <laughs> that I can't say on the show, good but old, it, it, was, it was, it was, uh, well, no, it was F U and <laughs> F U cutter. Yeah. Um, yeah, that happened. Um, I mean, yeah, look, you sure saw that, did. look, you saw that all week. Okay. People were doing it. Like people were chanting that in the stands that you saw that. I'm sure you saw the story about the fans that tried to go to Boston college and had to like go through, like wait through security just to hell. And the signs yeah, that were being held up and stuff. It's, it's and, a little soft out of Boston college security, but I get it. There's, there's also an element where it's a little like, and I understand, understand this is the way the fan base is, but there is an element where it's a little much for stuff like With, that. You want to change, you want to change your, your old Ivan Provorov jerseys to Jamie Drysdale jerseys. Oh, I'll, be my oh, I'm doing it for Monday. I absolutely have duct tape ready to go. Absolutely. Um, that's a, that's, that's a beautiful thing. That's funny. Um, so that in and of itself, like he, and he said something to the to the effect of that's like the loudest he's ever heard a place while playing too. Like that, that was like that, that was really cool. Yep. But this was before, but before the cameras were on him and before he did his interview, he opens the door to come back into the locker room to do this and sees like 20 some odd, me, you know, me and twenty some other others. There's us, not that much media, in right? With whatever, and and just let out a, whoa, like, <laughs> like and, 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 and like we walked out of the room after it was done, and I, I said, to, I think I said to somebody who I was walking with as we went to where tour to do never, the tour push, and I'm like, I'm like, it's not like Anaheim, is it, kid? You he's know, never like, had this that much media Anaheim in anymore. a post game. Nope. You know, but he, but but like, he's he's just from first impressions anyway. Extremely likable guy people are going to embrace this kid like nobody's business they're going to just the fact that he's here he's got a relationship already by the way like he's friends with cam york yep. he's trained he's trained with scott lawton in the off seasons a little bit so he, he already he's, knew some guys coming in and first, first impression on my end he seems like a nice humble kid ready to show up work hard help the team win something okay and this is going to tie a couple things together from what we previously talked about this was another really key point to the uh whole 24 hours of like getting yourself ready to play in a new city kind of thing and all that. Danny Briere apparently like talked to obviously talked to Drysdale throughout the course of everything happening or whatever. Right. 
But before he played in the first game, knowing he was going to be able to probably play on Wednesday, goes, you want your parents to come in? And boy, did that stick with Drysdale. Like, you, yeah, they would love to come and see me play and whatever right. and things like that. And so now his parents are sitting in the building as everybody is giving him this giant love fest. They got to appreciate that. Like, how how much better of a first impression can you make on not only the kid, but his family for like, it, it we're, ready take, to, we're ready to back this guy for however long he's here. It would take four or five Ducks games to get that many fans cheering for him. <laughs> And it just seemed like, like, and, and, and the thing was like Drysdale talked about how that's going to stick with him. Yep. The, that free, you know, the Briere took the initiative to say, do you want your parents to come to this game and we'll get them out here? And they did Yep. like and that's I'm... and, and, and that is, that is classic flyers, organizational type stuff. That's how it's done. I'm so family stu- oriented. I'm so stupid excited for this kid. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like, well, now, that, now here's the other part of it. Like, he's going to need time to adjust to the defensive zone play and stuff like that. And, like, look, the first couple of games, was he great there? No. No. Like, no, he's, no, no. And that's fine. You like the offensive side of things. And look, and Tortorella, that is going to be his hallmark. Well, Tortorella dropped the biggest line that you could possibly want to hear if you're excited about him because he called him a rover. Yep. And that's that's, uh, that's terminology he used for Zach Wierenski. Like that if they terminology- if they turn him into anything like Zach Wierenski, they've won something significant. I mean, I'm not saying they've oh, yeah. won the trade in full. Like maybe maybe it just turns out that both sides actually win. But that they'll this- have that's a huge success if they are able to turn him into anything close to what Zach Wierenski became under under pretty much the same coaching staff. And that's the, that's really the guy I can't wait to get his hand like for him to get his hands on this kid. It's not Tortorella. I can't wait to see what Bradshaw does to this. This team's starting to look a lot like that Columbus team that beat Tampa a couple years ago. They've got a vibe team. about them. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, And then obviously, look, obviously, I'm talking about what Brad Shaw can do to teach from the defensive side of things, obviously. Mm-hmm. He's already, look, you, you've already seen it in small sample, but you've seen it. Put him on a power play and he's quarterback. Oh, yeah. Well, and and we saw that it kind of took a lot of this roster a little bit of time to adjust to the Torts defensive system. So, sure. He, Give even if Drysdale doesn't look great defensively the rest of the season, give him an off season, right? He seems like the kind of kid who's going to go and just absolutely absorb everything he's got. And obviously, the key here, and this is the one thing we haven't talked about, and this is the this is to bring it back to reality a little bit because the one key to all this is he's got to stay on the ice. Absolutely, you know, he missed some injury history. Well, he played eight games and then missed the rest of the 22 23 season with a shoulder injury, torn labrum. Yep. Yep, and then. He missed some time this year already, too, with a lower body injury. So in order for him to be at his best and be most effective, he's going to have to be available. But the potential potential is great, especially when, like, the year before he got hurt for almost the entire year, he was a 19-year-old, basically not probably want to call prospect because he had played played it at 18 in the NHL. But he's 19 years old. He plays 81 games. He had 32 points. That's not bad. For a... Wait, for a teenager. For a tr- well, for an atrocious Anaheim Ducks team. Sure. For an sure. Embarrassingly bad Anaheim Ducks team. All right. Are we yeah. done with um are we uh, done with Drysdale too? And we want to get to some of the games. Yeah, I know I know that we're uh we're looking at a little bit of a time crunch here, but we do have to talk about uh the actual on ice products. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, part we, we did here. a little bit of, well, we did a little bit already with some of the Drysdale right. stuff because obviously so, we played this week, but right. So Monday night was that Pittsburgh game. That ended up being pretty irrelevant. You know, the Flyers lost four one. The effort wasn't, you know, it there was a buzz in the building and people were distracted, and you could kind of tell through most of that game. Well, it it, it didn't help matters that even when the trade came down, they were already down one nothing. Right, Pittsburgh jumped out like, to a little bit of a quick start on that. One. Right, and I mean, look, was it still a game for a chunk of time? Like they got, they went down two nothing. They got one of them back on the power play, no less. Sure. And you're thinking, all right, maybe something turns or whatever. And the third goal that they gave up was kind of killer. And then, like obviously, as as it got through everything, like they gave up a fourth one, it was over. Um, the only disappointing part about that game in terms of like if the effort wasn't completely there or if like and I know it was a weird night in general at the arena and things like that. But the only disappointing part was is that was the last divisional game you were going to play until the stadium series. And at at least at that given moment, it's like those are the ones you really want to have. It was a pretty lackluster effort. Right. And you're that. like, oh, and, and to be fair, by the way, like they had just kind of gutted out the game against Calgary that they won. And otherwise they had lost you know, four in a row before that. And now they lose another one. You're kind of like, like the Calgary game could have done one of two things, at least in the immediate that you felt it was either springboard them to another win and start like a little bit of a streak going or 
continue the losing from before. And it was kind of like, so that still felt like a bit of a reality check where you're like, all right, is this thing starting to slip here? Is this where it starts to end? It was the literal halfway point of the season, or it was the 40th game of the season. Yep. You're just, now you're going to go on a halfway point. So you're still in, you're still in the playoffs at that point, but you lose and, five out of, you lose five out of six. And it's like, this and, is what we worried about. And then, and then the team got a kick in the ass. And you saw for the rest of the week that the game plan was a race in two goal leads, apparently, because when, Wednesday night you play Montreal, you go down in the first 11 and a half minutes of the game. You climb on the only, back. Go ahead. Yeah. Because on the only two shots of the period. Yeah. It was the tough look out of Sam, uh, Sam Erson, right? Yeah. It was, uh, sure. it was a tough start to the game for Sam. Um, he recovered fairly well. He of looked good. He, in, he looked good in the second and third. Obviously, he was perfect the rest of the way. Obviously, you, he was a great in another shootout. Shootout, Sam, baby. Yeah. Um, you gave your team a chance to come back. Owen Tippett, Morgan Frost. Man, Owen Tippett had a week, didn't he? Sure. And well, and okay. So this was something also about like the re, like I I think it was right at the start of the homestand. I had said this, and I like I'm like. You know what I need to see this week or over the course of the next few games, at least like during the homestand or whatever, somebody okay. not named Travis connect me and Joel Farabee scoring the goals. Cause it's been like those, that's been the story. Like no other forwards are scoring. And then Owen Tippett and finally Owen Tippett said that. Well, Owen Tippett finally got on one of those roles where you're like, all right, there we go. Like now there's somebody else who's doing something like now it's going to make a difference. I, I did also want to mention at the end of this game, uh, Owen Tippett has the puck in overtime. And records the single fastest speed burst in the NHL this season. You know what's interesting about that, though? And and if you watch the play, though, he doesn't get, like, a real good angle. Right. Because, like, Caden Gould is the one back on that. Oh, no, he just blows he by him. No, but, no, he didn't really blow by him com completely. That's what I'm saying. Like, he got a bit of a bad angle to go in, so he didn't really get to cut straight in on goal. Gooley stays with him pretty much stride for stride somehow. Yeah, Gooley's fast. And no, and took away the pass. So you didn't have the pass to Lawton. You didn't have really an angle to get to the net. So he never really got a great shot off. I'm I mean, if he to... scores, if it look, of course, if he gets a gets a better angle and he scores on the thing, then it's one of the best plays we'll have ever seen in the course of the season. Of but... course, right? Just funny that I, I I bring up the flyer setting the record for the fastest single speed burst of the season, and you're like, yeah, and Caden Gooley played it really well defensively. Well, because if if it like I like I'm not like I'm not trying to yeah. deny that fa that that Tippett didn't hit another gear, man. He on was that sense because he he realized how much time was left and just put his head down and started going, and it was fast. I'm not he, trying to say it wasn't. He, he looked it, like Ryan Howard rounded in second. He was. <laughs> Uh, rumbling he was hauling um so okay so so that was what by the way so Tippett scored in like we said Tippett had scored in that game too right so Tippett scored in three straight um, by the time we get to Friday anyway yep um so anyway yeah and shootout Sam does his thing the Flyers win in Mon uh against Montreal in a shootout take the two which, points okay which by the way massive for the end of the homestand because you either you like you were in a position where you were going to get three out of eight points okay you get it to overtime that's four out of eight you really wanted that other one though so and it you, comes out as five did. out of eight and yep. like and what what it did also was is that it took the previous four game road trip out of the holiday break and even the points across the board you got yep. three out of eight on the road trip five out of eight on the homestand and you're looking at all right it's like going you know went four and four you went 500 in both right, right. you went 500 all right could, could it like could it have gone better sure was there a little bit of an expected lull sure. sure it all worked itself out you balanced it out and that was fine and then you get on this particular road trip which by the way is the last one that really crosses mate like crosses time zones right and these are these are almost your last three games in central and time. i kind of want to against the blackhawks and i kind of want to Right. And I kind of want to jump ahead to Saturday, like a little bit, not like I'm not skipping what happened in Friday's game to talk about this, but I'm jumping ahead to Saturday because you really needed Friday because of how Saturday already looked. Winnipeg was on an eight game winning streak, 14 game point streak, playing as well as anybody in the league has Hadn't taken over more the than three goals in 25, 30 games, whatever right. it is, has taken over the NHL lead in points, all of that. Right. Yep. And you needed, so you needed, if you were going to keep this thing oh, going the right way, you needed to win on Friday to at yeah. least give yourself the position to have what I said was going to happen last week, which was on, on the last scheduled week's show. Loss. Okay, I was going to say, on last week's show, you called it a scheduled loss. Like you're right. not expecting a win here. Right. So if you win against Montreal on Wednesday, like you did, and then you go on the road and beat Minnesota, who's again, but by the way, both teams that are in the same general area in the standings, 
Yeah. Then at least you soften the blow of, well, it's probably not their night in Winnipeg, but that's okay because at least they'll have won a couple of games. And then you play a team like St. Louis that falls into the same category as the others. And you can come away from, you know, saying three out of four is pretty good right now as we come as, as they come back home and there's another four, I think it's another four games in a row at home. And again, try to figure out a way to get home cooking again, because that could be the difference between where you are in the standings from the start of the month to the end of the month. Oh yeah. And this looked incredibly bleak at three to one in the third period early. Oh, it sure did. And, and they, and to their credit, you get, you get one player who hasn't scored in a while to finally get one. Tyson Forrester gets we on the board. It. And it was a nice little shot too. Sure. That was a pretty little Tyson Forrester goal. And then here comes Owen Tippett again, and he scores. And now the game's tied. Drysdale picks up another assist on that one, by the way. I know. And and you're grind and you're grinding it out from there, right? Like they they gave up chances toward the end of regulation. Like you're trying oh, yeah. to grind it out. You're you're just get it to the overtime. At least you get a point out of it. That's a start. And then overtime can be what it'll be. And they get a power play in overtime. And the yep. power play scores. Like the one weakness they've had for all season long comes through at four on three. A little gives Joel you the Farabee net front tip. Absolutely pretty. Well, after and this is this is to go back to Drysdale again. After. He turns it over at the offensive blue line to essentially give up a breakaway, back checks like nobody's business, makes yep. a play, and they go the other way and they scored about 10 seconds later. That's now, how that's that's exciting right there. Now I will say I was questioning the fact that they had two defensemen on the ice on the power play in the the overtime period. They really like I mean Drysdale obviously makes sense in an overtime of especially course. with more space. They like Zamula on the power they, play. Well, they well they like what he's done, what he's yeah. done because he's he's got a confidence about him with the puck now and that's really been the key for him throughout the course of all of this is like he's got to be confident. He's got to be able to and He like, has been. And he has been. And I'm not trying like like let's put it this way, okay? Cuz Zamula's having a year right now and I'm not trying to make the comparison just based off of a couple of easy obvious things to say about this. But He's having the kind of year that made people look at Phil Myers a certain way. Yep. Ex- except, do you know what I see when I see him right now? And I, I think other people do too, to an extent. Okay. A perfectly good third pairing defenseman. Absolutely. Like, yep. I, I, I think that with all the younger defensemen they already have in the system too. By the way, like I think that's why people stretched for Myers because it was like, okay, Sam Moran's not working out, and Robert Haig kind of is what he is, and blah blah. It's like, if, man, if, if if Myers could be top pairing along with like. Provorov or Sanheim or the Flyers whatever. have been searching for like one more defenseman trademark for like 10 years. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think with some of the other guys now, like there's people who look at Zamul and it's just like he doesn't yep. have to be top pairing or anything special. He's amounting to something that's consistent at the back end on the third pairing and and, and can throw in a little bit of special teams time too. It's like okay, that's Huge. fine. Like that's fantastic. That works, you know? And, and he's, he's really grown this year. Like he's the reason why, like he's one of the main reasons why I can't wait to see what Brad Shaw does with Drysdale because it's like Zamula looked like he almost wasn't even going to have a future at the NHL. That's how bleak it was starting to look for him. Right. And he's turned into a guy that now you can sit there and say, he feels like he should be a regular. Right. He's well, earning and, it as a regular. And you talk about Rasmus Ristolainen and staying in the, the lineup kind of to provide some size. Zamula's I love him on the too. third pairing too, but but I love I love him on the third pairing in that sense because it makes perfect sense to take a guy like that who may not be the best defensively either yep. and say, just don't get then don't get the significant minutes at five on five. It's no, okay. I agree. I agree. I think it's good that he stays in your lineup. He does provide a little bit of size. Six three, huge dude. But he's adjusted his game too to where it's not all about I'm gonna go just hit somebody. No, of he, course. He doesn't he doesn't go out of his way to hit somebody and get out of position. He does it, he's now doing it way more strategically. It's clearly something that they've worked on as from a like from a coaching standpoint, and he looks way better for it. And I don't care that like for all of the years, like it's really funny to go back and look when they play a team and see that his career numbers against certain teams are like really good offensive numbers. And he's not really that guy anymore. Like yeah. they, they've turned him into more of a like. He's I'm not a stay at home, home, but it's pretty close. No, no, no. <laughs> but you know what? You know what they've turned him into? Seriously. And this is what everybody said. Like, I, I can't believe I'm like buying into this, but it's what everybody has said they've waited for. The type of guy you want to have for a playoff run. Because if he doesn't go out of position and if he's going to be physical and you know it's going to ramp up, he doesn't need to score five goals that are not, you know, 
you know, at, right. like in garbage time or something. He doesn't need to score five goals over the course of whatever. He can have one goal and however few assists he's got if he's doing what he's doing on a third pairing like that. Yep. And I know it's, you know, is it rich for a third pairing guy? Yeah, but but you That's know okay. what? You know what though? You've swapped you you've rotated things in and out of place as guys have done things differently. Like Sean Walker's making two point six five million dollars this year and he's playing look, look, he's playing in a role that's different. He's playing he's out playing this contract. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. But that's the and that's the difference. Nick Sealer's probably out playing his. Nick Sealer's Absolutely. making under a million dollars. Right. Travis right, so, Sanheim, even with a raise, is borderline out playing his. Um well that's gonna age well. Okay, yeah, right? and then um, absolutely how about the Winnipeg? How about the Winnipeg game? Yep, I was gonna say. So you you go into Minnesota, you steal two points in Minnesota, then you go to Winnipeg, a game that you call the scheduled loss. It's Saturday night. They're the best team, one of the best teams in right. hockey. Connor Hellebuck looks even, completely unstoppable. It becomes even more of a scheduled loss when they tell you Sean Couturier and Jamie Drysdale are not playing. Yep. Both due to illness, correct? No, Couturier was a minor lower body oh, okay, injury. Okay, okay. He had, from what I understand, I saw a few people who were on the trip who co- are covering the team um, that said he tweaked something a little bit in morning skate, went off the ice, came back to try to test it, still left early after that, and then, almost almost possibly didn't play on Friday. Okay. Gutted it out. They went in overtime, and I guess they just didn't want to push it, so... And, and you um, know what? I'm okay with treating him with a little bit right. of kid gloves. We so we'll see about St. Louis. I would imagine that maybe taking the Saturday off and then look, they're obviously not doing anything on ice on Sunday. So right. maybe then, he's good for money. And then they get two days off after the fact, too. So maybe right. that allows for a window a of search where they feel like they can. Kateri is a guy who really wants to play. So if he doesn't have to be out, he won't be, but of we'll course. see how Monday goes. And um, then as for Drysdale getting sick, you can't really be surprised. When Drysdale guy... didn't get any sleep on Monday into right. Tuesday. So exactly. I think it was kind of like, well, and they know, talked about it. The fact that, you know, the, the Anaheim ducks were heading to Florida on a road trip. Right. And then he got traded to the Philadelphia flyers and they're like, Oh, Hey, by the way, uh, Minnesota and Winnipeg. Right. So, um, but so what a you know, but what a what a testament to what this team kind of has been all year. First of all, by the way, Cam Atkinson hadn't scored in twenty six games in his Saturday two night one. was the Cam Atkinson show. Sure, and well, it, it was kind of the Cam Atkinson show, and then it was really the Sam, the Sam Harrison, Harrison show, show because like you because you know what's amazing about that you were going to basically need that kind of game to even have a shot to win it, and then he and he shuts them out like. Yep. And the fact that you have two goalies that can do that. It, isn't it a weird feeling that they've got yeah. two guys that can do this? And, and like, I don't want to take away from the fact that Carter Hart let in a really bad one against Minnesota. I get it. But like, what did I say all last year about Carter Hart? Um, well, you re- refresh my memory then. Cause I'm trying that to, you have to trade him because he's winning you too many games. He's too good. He's stealing you too many points. He's tanking your, your draft position, oh, right, et cetera, right, right. et cetera, et cetera. Is it, now, that it, is it possible it wouldn't have mattered? Well, as, that, well, sure. But <laughs> as, as we sit here now, A, I'm glad you didn't trade Carter Hart. B, you now have two goalies that can go out there, and even if your team's effort is a little bit lackluster, sure, can steal you two points. I do just want to remind you before we like get too deep into the Carter Hart thing for a second, because Carter Hart needs a contract after this year, and obviously yep. there's a lot of circumstances uh, that yep. still surround some stuff and things like that. But he's also going to be due for a raise. Oh yeah, and he's certainly. making near four million dollars. Do you real and you realize that Sam harrison has got a contract that hasn't even kicked in yet? Yeah, but it's only one and a half, right? Oh no, no, no! I know what I'm saying. They've already got him locked up for two yeah. more years, and it hasn't even kicked in yet. That one's huge. Like so, Carter Hart's going to get his so raise. If you really fine. like no, so if you really like what Harrison's doing, oh, and no, and you've got other goalies in the pipeline that may work their way along. At what point does Carter Hart become the guy that whether or not like look? Are I you hate, about to suggest that Carter Hart's expendable? Not just ex- well, expendable is tough because again, teams aren't going to trade with the situation being what it is. And uh, of sign- course, and, of course. Well, and signing him is going to be hard. Like, like if you think that Carter Hart's getting the contract that Connor Hellebuck signed in the off season, it's not happening. If, if there's not clarity on the Team Canada situation, right. no, it's not happening. You're getting a, longer than no. a year or two. Right, it's a year or two. Bingo. Yeah. And that's the way it's going to be. And then you have to factor in the price and whatever, you know, goes into that. Cause you don't want to be like, you can afford, obviously, can you afford to spend some money on that? Sure. But you don't want to go to the level. That's like, like, I don't know that you're going to the level of where he's a six, $7 million defense or goaltender. I just don't know no, if you're doing it right. I, now. I don't think you can. And right. obviously 
we're still waiting for clarity on that. We assumed we were going to get it in August, so we'll see if we ever do. But um, all real. right, but, I, but I think either that puts a little cap on the games that they've played already sure. this week. But, Let's but, do a little. But that's the thing. So yeah. so impressive how they were able to do that. They they end the week now with three straight wins, which is massive. I mean, like you, by, like by the by the way, and I'm not trying to like. <laughs> I always sit there and say I'm trying to be like as even keeled with this type of stuff as possible, but I I caught the final maybe 10-ish minutes of the Rangers Capitals game earlier on Saturday, which was, oh yeah, I, I was, was watching the, it at work. It was a good that game. was the um what super I think it was the one o'clock game, right? Uh yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is hours before the they, Flyers are gonna play. They they snuck a game in before the NFL playoffs started. Sure. And by the way. So I look and I see what's going on, and I realize that if if for some strange reason the Flyers were to win the game against the Jets on uh, Saturday, Saturday night, night, that suddenly they would be within two points of the New York Rangers for the Metropolitan Division lead. And sure then you're are. watching the game unfold, and you're going, they're going to be within two points of the Metropolitan Division lead. What yep. is going on here? Yep. And Crazy. as Crazy. it sits right here on Sunday morning, uh, they are five points clear of a playoff spot. That, what? <laughs> They're five points clear of a playoff spot in mid January. We're I know. like six, we're six weeks from the trade deadline. Kevin, I don't, I don't think I them adding is as crazy as you alluded to. And I'm not. Uh, listen, I'm not saying that they're emptying the chamber. I'm not saying they're trading every first, second, and third they have. But the fact to sit here and say they're not going to add anything, I don't know though. I just don't know. I mean. Part of the problem is, is that you God, still have I, to see, but part of the problem is you still have to see where everything goes with everything else. Like, like, like truth be told, here's an, ex here's an example of some of the clarity that you're looking for over the course of these weeks coming up. The Flyers are winning their game against the Jets. They go and they get the two points and all that stuff, right? The Islanders were playing in Nashville and it's a one, one game into the final minute of the third period. So it looks like at, at the very least, the Islanders are also going to get a point. You were, you were already two points ahead of them to begin with coming into the night, but that also has to do with the fact that you played an extra game this weekend. So they have a game in hand too. So you're not getting overly excited if they get two points in this one and they have the ability to basically pass you by tying you sure, sure. in points. Right. And the Predators scored with eight seconds left and then put an empty netter in with one second left. And suddenly they get nothing. Now they're four points behind all of a sudden. That's where clarity is going to come from. If you don't get that level of clarity, it's not like you're going to keep fighting it. And the deadline's going to be tense because people aren't going to want to be moving stuff that when they think they have a shot. Right. Well, and looking ahead to this week, obviously, we'll see how the trade line deadline goes. We'll be following that as we go along because sure. we're way more invested than we might have been otherwise. Um. But as we sit here right now, we're looking ahead. Uh, Flyers play in St. Louis this week, and then it's three home games. Dallas, Correct. Colorado, Ottawa. You're looking at at least two or three winnable games there. And honestly, with the way they've been playing, why not all four? Um, Who knows? We'll see. I mean, realistically, St. Louis is a team that you probably should beat, you know, kind of towards the bottom half of the standing. And then you get two testers. Um, Dallas and Colorado are in the top, really top 10 of the league. I guess it's close to top five. Dallas is just below it. That could shuffle as the week goes on. I think it's really important that they get two days before that call or before that Dallas game. Absolutely. The Colorado game is going to be interesting because that's the first of a back to back on the weekend. So kind of some flexibility there where you kind of you, you're going to be a little bit more rested playing that game both, than you will Ottawa. But both day games too. both. Yeah. One o'clock. Oh, those are that, weird that can, schedule can be a fun weekend, though, when you got two afternooners like that. It's going to be fun. So absolutely, especially if there's an Eagles game slotting in. But we don't know Somewhere about that. We'll, one yet, we'll so. deal with that when we get there. I don't, I don't think you have to worry about it. Don't. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I know we got a little bit of a time thing going on. We got to get out of here. Is there anything else that you wanted to get to here? Nope. All right. I think we had a really good week. Uh, Jamie Drysdale is a flyer. He will be next week as well. And uh, we'll be back. So in the meantime, follow us on social media. We're at YWT Podcast. Uh, follow the show everywhere you can find your podcast, including sportstalkphilly.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow Kevin everywhere at Kevin underscore Darso. And boy, we're just along for the ride at this point. We got like 10 weeks till the playoffs. Something like yeah. that. All something right. I guess we'll see. We'll see you.